All right, all right. What is up, everybody? It is another Monday night. It's another living force with no spoilers. We're going to say that a bunch tonight, but it's still High Republic time here at Utini. We're going to talk what we loved about the Wave 2 launch. We're going to talk about spoiler etiquette, and we're going to give you a little sneak peek at some of our favorite designs in the High Republic. Spoilers for one of mine here. We're glad you're here. We got a guest host, but Corey's in the chat. Wes, budget! What is up, everyone? Welcome into the Living Force Utini Network podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Eric Eilerson, and joining me tonight to talk all about the High Republic, of course, yet again, is a full crew, but not the crew you may expect. First of all, straight from his sunny room that gets slightly darker as the show goes on, we got Dr. Charles Hankel. Uh, Charles, Charles, we're doing the show. Oh, hello. Charles. Oh, hey. Uh, hey, hey, everybody. Hey, how's it going? Um... I just want to say that uh, I want to spoil things very badly, but I won't do it. I'm going to keep my lips locked. It's going to be fine. Yeah, for our audio listeners there, uh, we got we got Charles. We caught him as he was reading Rising Storm during the intro because uh, not not finished yet, but may, or no, you did finish it, didn't no, you? No, I finished it. I finished reading it, it again. Eric, that was called a gag. <laughs> that I, just I get did. it. He is being dramatic. Well, the real dramatic gag is the drama that Wes Jenkins brings every single week, and he will yet again. What's up, Wes? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Great day. Good day. I uh, got a lot of cleaning done. A lot of cleaning that should have been done yesterday, but I feel good. <laughs> yep. I feel got cleaning done, got the meals in, had a workout, and I'm ready to podcast. It's great. I got oh, Wes, your hair looks great tonight. Yeah, Man, I was going to say, you got a good coif. Yeah, it's fresh. Look at that. It's freshly washed and non-blow dried, so I didn't put any... I didn't put anything wow. in it, so I, I hope y'all like it. You heard that. <laughs> Audio natural. listeners, Wes washed his hair this week, and that's right? what you're missing. Um, but what you're also missing is good old Timothy Guthrie, our CFO, the former Conjure Book Club host, the all good things in the Patreon Utini community, and the much taller than you may think he is man. What's up, dude? Dude, I am so good, and it is so glad. I'm so glad to be here. And yeah, you replaced the shortest person on the team with the tallest person. So it is my honor to step into the very tiny shoes of the one and only Corey Helton. So, oh, my, I love it. I love it. Uh, we're so glad to have you here, man, to talk about all things High Republic. So later on in the main part of our show, as I said, we're going to be talking about. What we loved about this wave, uh, we're going to talk about our Discord and our spoiler etiquette on how we avoid them and how you can avoid them in the future. And, of course, we're going to geek out, now that we have almost two waves in, about our favorite designs across the initiative. But first of all, I just want to ask you guys a basic question. We're now one week since, almost one week since Rising Storm and Rift Crash Point Tower came out, which is weird because it seems like it's been three months. But... <laughs> How has it been for you guys, like, as, as far as our community? I know some of us are more into a Discord than others. The Twitter reaction, like, how does it feel to be one week into this Wave 2 initiative? I've seen, I've seen a, lot of, uh, a lot of Slack messages for the Rising Storm. Um, I haven't got all the way through it. I haven't, I'm about a quarter of the way. Um, so I don't, I don't know what to say. I can't join in with everybody, but um, apparently this book is... Uh, it's something to something to behold. It, it's got a it's got a hell of an ending, and I don't know what the ending is, and everybody's talking about it. Charles, you know. <laughs> I do know, um, and I'm not going to say anything about it other than that it's good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I genuinely still have not seen a negative thing. I don't think about this book, and I'm reading the spoiler messages now. Like, I'm on the Twitter as the kids say and i just i've seen i've seen nothing bad um and this feels like it really took all the momentum of light of the jedi and the rest of wave one and just is building like launching right off of it so i hope that this is how every wave is yeah tim how about yeah. you man you've been I, you've oh. been way in every in every channel i've been seeing you yeah, I agree completely. I mean, I feel like Light of the Jedi walked so the Rising Storm could run. I mean, it is <laughs> yes. it is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and I feel like 
yeah, it happened a week ago, but I feel like I've been living this thing for years, just going back and watching everyone else experience it over and over again um, at their varying levels. I think I've read the book six times by now at this point. That's what it feels <laughs> <Yeah>. like. <laughs> totally. And, and it's been so cool because it has been such a communal experience. And and I love that our, our community especially has been going through in, in much more of a book club style than normal where people are like, I'm on chapter 30. I'm on chapter 52. I'm on chapter seven. Oh, I finished it. And every time someone finishes it, there's like a swarm of like, hey, are you okay? We got like a, a bunch of people just helping that person through what they just read. Um, and then I also got to say, I'm going to reach over here. I got my uh, my Target exclusive cover, which I absolutely adore. Um, yes. I have never seen a community uh, come together so much about a freaking sticker. The stickers on these <laughs> books, y'all, were so hard to get off. <laughs> but we did it. Because look at that gorgeousness. You can't have that. You can't have goo. You can't have goo on Bell Zetafar or Elzar Man. Come on now. Yeah. I was, uh, I, it was my target sticker was right on the chest of Elzar Man. And as I'm, I mean, I, I had a good one too. I had this part where it was, it was all peeling off and I was like, this is going easier than I expected. <laughs> and then that shred of something just stayed on there and I had to pick it off. And I thought I had actually picked a hole in the cover on Elzar Man's chest, but it was, it was his shirt. Thank God, but <laughs> man, <laughs> although was, I'm not gonna lie, it off. if any of the Jedi would would be okay with a sticker being ripped off of their chest, I feel like Elzar might be kind of into it. No spoilers, but like you know, if you know, you know. I'll Can say it. <laughs> I'm not afraid of it. Um, and also, uh, just a reminder to you all: if you're reading through Rising Storm or Crash Point Tower, uh, our reviews of Rising Storm are out on utini.com right now. The written review by myself and the YouTube video review by our very own Emma Park are up right now. So if you haven't checked those out, go ahead, click those links, give it a like when you can. And tomorrow, as of recording, so July 6th, will be Crash Point Tower Day. So our reviews for Crash Point Tower are going to be coming out on all the platforms. And stay tuned for a little more news on stuff we'll be dropping tomorrow in the weekly roundup coming up in a bit. But we also wanted to take some time, speaking of our content, uh, to do a little call to action here. This past Wave 2, we've been really loving how the, the writers and the characters of the High Republic are more diverse than ever. And even last year, we did a whole show about how, how few writers of color there have been in Star Wars and how it's been an issue. Now, that's getting way better in Star Wars across the board, and we love that. And we at Utini also want to be better with that as well. So, we want to put out an official call to all uh, BIPOC and female content creators that would like to work with us, that would like to either come on as a writer, um, do video things. If you want to be a part of the Utini community, we got a lot of white dudes here. And I love you guys. No, I love you guys. I'm the Steven. There's no, no shame in that. But we want more voices of more people that are being represented in Star Wars. We want them to be represented within our company. So if that's something, something you may want to do, shoot us an email. Uh, we got tons of places on the site you can contact. Uh, CEO at utini.com goes straight to Corey. Sorry, buddy, you're in the chat. Uh, but, but that is a great way to get that ball rolling. If it, our content is something you'd like, if it's something you'd like to add your voice to, we would absolutely love that. So CEO at utini.com, uh, send us an email and see if we can work together. It'd be tons of fun. All right, now, scooch on over from a professional community to a support community with our Patreon. We love you all. We love our patrons. We thank you guys every week because you are the reason we're able to afford to do certain things with the community. And this week, after a long time away, we have a patron of the week. Charles, I have missed your dulcet tones reading these paragraphs. Would you mind? <laughs> I would not mind at all because the patron of the week this week is Caroline. And uh, Caroline says this. Hello, my name is Caroline and I'm from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I honestly don't remember a time when I wasn't into Star Wars. I can't even remember the first time I watched The Phantom Menace, though I do remember my first time watching A New Hope and being terrified of Darth Vader. Growing up in the prequel era, I just got to be surrounded by Star Wars all the time, from movies to video games to toys. Did anyone else play a tactics? To Gendy Clone Wars, the franchise permeated my childhood, and I enthusiastically led it, allowing me to make me the nerd I am today. But I didn't start reading Star Wars books until this past January with the release of Light of the Jedi and have now read 14 canon books so far. Woo! 14 and a half as I make my way through the Rising Goodness. Storm. Dang. Padme is and has always been my favorite Star Wars character and Excellent. so any of her stories sit very highly with me. Obviously, I love her novels and her relationship with Sabe is one of my favorites in the whole franchise. 
Also, even though I'm only three and a half stories in, The High Republic is already in the running for my favorite Star Wars story slash era of all time. Being a Star Wars fan online has always been tricky to navigate, especially as a woman. I've always been an advocate for positive fandom, no matter what the franchise. Being the enthusiast that I am, I'm constantly wanting to talk about what I love about Star Wars. When I found Utini and saw it was an entire community of people who thought the same way, I knew I had to be a part of it. It's been so nice to get to know fellow nerds who live out the epitome of fandom. Question for the hosts. If you had to pick one musical motif from Star Wars to be your theme song, what would it be? Mine would hands down be Ray's Ooh. theme. May the force be with you. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Great questions. Also, Caroline is in the chat right now. What's up? Uh, Caroline nice. is also a member of our team uh, that will be... Uh, I'm always bad at what can I what I can say that will be incorporated coming soon down the line with projects and stuff and things. Nailed nice. it. Nice. One take. Perfect. Okay, so I'll start uh, this off because mine. <laughs> please do. Mine uh, is not. I mean, it's, it's not. It's not great because it's it's the one she just said. It's Ray's theme. I love mm. Ray's theme. It's mm -hmm. so good. Um. So, I mean, just the. I wanted to do. I put this in um, in our ideas for podcasts is want to do like a, a podcast episode on music, like music in mm -hmm. Star Wars and all the themes, because every major character has a theme. And one of the best themes that that gets me every time I hear it is Ray's theme. Ray's theme is great. I mean, from episode mm -hmm. six, I'm sorry, episode seven through nine. It's mm -hmm. it's amazing. I love it. I mean, it's the whole reason John Williams didn't like retire. He came back to Star Wars because he wanted to write for Ray. Like he said that in interviews. And that theme is like what brought the maestro into the sequel trilogy. So great choice yeah. by Wes and Carolina alike. Um, yeah. What do you guys got? I, I don't, I'm not going to choose like a character's theme. Cause I think she just said, what's your theme song. Um, and so my theme song is going to be battle of the heroes. It has to be, yeah. it has to be battle of the heroes. Yeah. You're right. Cause that you're is right. like, <laughs> that is the moment like Ooh. that just is star Wars to me. And Obi Wan is super badass in that all of that. So I mean, yes, of course, it's Battle of the Heroes. And that, Love that Battle of the Heroes. What was playing in the background when I challenged you to a duel for the uh, the draft episode, Charles, on Twitter. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so it's already was, in your theme. That was my moment. <laughs> You're already there, man. All right, Tim. What about you, dude? Uh, I don't know about a theme song per se, but. If there's a if there's one song that gets me in my feelings all into Star Wars, it's Burying the Dead by oh my Kevin Kiner. You from bastard. the end of the, yeah. <laughs> it's so oh. so sad, so heartbreaking, but it just it gets me in the moment and like I really feel like yeah. that's Star Wars. Um, yeah. And so any yeah. anytime I feel that I hear that, I have to stop whatever I'm doing and just listen all the way through. Ooh. I'm sorry I'm, for the tears, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about it now. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> yeah. That's a great one. I wasn't one. really trying to feel this tonight, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm here for. Uh, I think I'm going to go on a two-part answer. Uh, Stephanie Mack just mentioned in the chat Samuel Kim, who if you guys uh. don't know, Samuel Kim does a bunch of amazing renditions of Star Wars music. And number one is my favorite piece of Star Wars music of all time. I don't think my life is personally epic enough for it. That's not putting myself down. That's just being realistic. And that's the Rise of Skywalker Suite by Samuel Kim. It's it's the music they used in the final trailer for the Rise of Skywalker, which is my favorite piece of music in the history of Star Wars. I listen to it anytime I get chills. So that's what I aspire to. But what I would love to be, I think, is the Flying with Chewie um, song by John Powell from Solo, where it's then when they're flying oh, after they escape from um, Mimban. Then they're just flying the Falcon for the first time, and Han and, and Han and Chewie are talking after they take their shower. The music that plays is just so peaceful and airy, and it's like about adventure, but it's also about just like calm and peace and friendship, and just kind of like a, it's a it's a vibe, as the kids say. Like, am I? Is it? Is it, it that? It's a mood. <laughs> yeah, it's a mood. So, uh, yeah, that'd be mine. But we are, that music episode of uh, is coming this year of themes and it's gonna be a great episode because we're gonna try to talk about music and not get copyright strikes will we do it who's to say uh tune in and see all right well thank you caroline and to all of our patrons that support us at utini.com slash patreon or patreon.com slash utini we love you we appreciate you and as a reminder next month 
August 20th, 14th. <laughs> Dang it. Something One of like the, that. The, there's a Friday in August. I'm going to look right now. I'm going to look right <laughs> I now. Think, I Stay think tuned. it's the 20th. It's the 20th. 21st. 20th. Friday, August 20th, we're going to be doing our trivia night with those hosts and Emma uh, to say thank you for being Patreon supporters. So stay tuned for that. All right. It's time. You know it. You love it. It's the Star Wars Weekly Roundup. Let's hit that. It's the Star Wars Weekly Roundup. <laughs> 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 All right, that was perfect. Um, okay, I'll try to live up to that. Hey, everyone. It's a Star Wars Weekly Roundup for July 5th. Uh, only a couple things we want to talk about today to catch you up on all the Star Wars goings on. We mentioned early in tonight's show that tomorrow, Tuesday the 6th, will be our Race to Crash Point Tower coverage day. So our written review will be going on the site. The video review will be coming up on YouTube. And... As a surprise that our patrons already know about, uh, we got to interview Daniel Jose Older. That's right, the writer of the book. Let me grab it. Right here, Race to Crash Point Tower. And another stellar addition to the High Republic. Daniel Jose Older made time in his busy release day. We literally interviewed him on release day. Uh, and we have a half hour interview coming your way. We do have a short clip we want to premiere on the show right now. So sit back, relax, and check out this preview of our talk with Daniel Jose Older. What I've been surprised by more than anything is how little I've been like restricted, honestly. Mm -hmm. I, and I said this on Twitter before, I constantly write be, with the understanding that like, not even in a bad way, I just know, you know, like, like I don't know what's gonna make it past the story group and what isn't, but 90% sure. of the time they're like, this is great, just make the guy purple or whatever, you know? Like, <laughs> that's so awesome. Like I, yeah. I just finished edits on a comic script for Higher Public Adventures and I was like, oh, I can, I can do all of this? Like, what? <laughs> like, it just Dude, blew my mind, and it's fun. Biscuits, so. biscuit recipes in Star Wars, man. Yes. Like, <laughs> no comment, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Like, look, like, <laughs> writing Geode is a challenge. Let's do it, yes. <laughs> like, it's hard That's to write. That's the question we all wanted to ask, by the way. <laughs> so when Claudia gave her thumbs up on that issue, I was like, oh, I did something. Like, that's, look. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to write a sentient rock. I will say that as soon as I read that character, though, I was like, Court and Geode have to hang out. Oh, those are two characters. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. Chilling. Like obviously, right? So that may or may not happen, but I'll tell you, that was on my wish list from the beginning. Ah, oh, you awesome. This is so this was something we've been working on for a while in the background. I got to interview Daniel with our our Cosmic Force friends, Emma and Jacob, uh, because he's such a great comics writer. Uh, we got to ask him about High Republic novels. We got to ask him about the comics, uh, and that is all coming out in full tomorrow on the show. And yeah, as as you could tell, he's he's just the kindest, coolest dude. Uh, had a ton of fun talking to him. So stay tuned. Check that out tomorrow. Next up. In actual news, uh, y'all, we got the Star Wars Visions panel this past weekend. And if you guys are unfamiliar, Star Wars Visions is the upcoming anime uh, project where a bunch of people at Lucasfilm hired a bunch of people that do traditional anime shows and kind of gave them free reign. And we got to get a little bit of insight on what's coming up. And before we go into specifics, guys, I want to ask you all as a whole, what did you think about the little bit of teaser footage and the additional details we got about visions. Dude, I'm so exciting. I'm, yeah, I'm stoked for this as one, especially who does not, I've never read a manga, never really watched anime, like to be able to have Star Wars in this universe, I think it's perfect for that bridge to be like, this could open the door to other things for me. Um, I'm totally. really excited about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the drawing is intense. I love that. Yeah. Like the, the lightsaber. Here, um, do you want to throw up the, the pictures that we have? Yeah, let's just go through some of these okay. images. Um, yeah, because we're getting, so we're getting, a, we yes. got a bunch of images here today. Oh my gosh, look at all this. So, this so we a, got a quick little preview oh. here, but we can go down and check out these, uh, check out the pictures. God, and they're all so different. This, so, audio listeners, we're looking at a bunch of preview images that we got um, today, and it's just, the, the variety in visual styles is so great. And I think that's what's so cool. So 
these are going to be premiering on September 22nd on Disney+. Plus. I'm not personally sure if they're dropping them all at once or it'll be weekly. It feels like it might be all at once because they're shorts. Um, but they're from a bunch of different anime studios. And they are the following. The studio, uh, Kamikaze Duga, is doing a short called The Duel. Uh, Gino Studio, Twin Engine, is doing Lop and Ocho. Studio Colorido is doing Tatooine Rhapsody, which is like a rock opera in Star Wars. Uh, the studio Trigger is doing two shorts, The Twins and The Elder. Kinema Citrus is doing The Village Bride. Science Saru is doing both Akakiri and T.O.B. 1, which is like a, a Astro Boy type robot cartoon or droid. Oh, my gosh. And then Production IG is doing The Ninth Jedi. So... Did uh did any of these I'm gonna put you all on the spot here, did any of these really kind of stick out to you personally? Cause I'm I have not done enough research yet to know which ones are which pictures and so forth. But Charles, I know you mentioned one specifically that you thought looked really good in our Slack. Um yeah, I, I said that the Akakiri uh one looked really good to me. Um and that was just based off of some of the concept art. If you watch kind of the full video that was released, it shows a little bit more than even uh, I think just these images and it has some of the names at the bottom mm-hmm. of which episodes they came from, but I was getting, I was getting some real solid samurai vibes from that story. Look at this yeah. picture here. Like the half trooper mask. I that is love it. Cool. cool. <laughs> this There's also one like... with a droid with a hat somewhere where it has the straw yes. hat. That's my favorite thing as well. I would <laughs> die for hat droid. <laughs> <laughs> this, this just feels like, the most free reign I feel like that anyone has probably mm. ever had with this property. I love that idea. Yeah. Cause it does seem like they, they, they repeated over and over. Uh, there's a great article on starwars.com. That's like 20 things that you didn't know about anime or, or whatever it is, you know, 20 things about star Wars visions. And they really like hit home on the fact that these creators were, were given that free reign. Like we don't know whether it's totally Canon or it's totally not. It's just these people saying, Hey, we love your style. We know you love Star Wars. What do you want to do? And what a beautifully like free way to create. I can't think of, so of cool. which I can't think of which director it was, but one of these story directors that's behind, you know, one of these shorts said that it's his last project. Ever. Yeah. I forgot like, which one that was. How yeah. nuts is oh, that? Wow. That he's like, you know, I'm I get to go out on a Star War. Like that's the yeah. coolest mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, and and when this comes out, we'll we'll obviously be covering them probably on a bounty hunt uh, again, depending on the format. But in the, in the comment section, I'm already seeing uh, as be nasty and Stephanie are saying the comment sections were really great on these videos too. You don't you, there wasn't as much toxicity as there are in some other videos, which is great. But as this comes up, we just want to remind folks that we we may not know if this is super canon or super not, and don't let the technicalities that we're gonna bring into it get in the way of what this project is like how incredible it is that this is being made you know i'm I just i'm very excited to sit back and enjoy these stories with y'all and uh i'm really glad that we got a preview and it's coming in september which is i mean it's july it is two and a half months not far yeah. <laughs> no it's very exciting and of course right around that time star wars visions ronin uh, which, if, if you all were in our Discord this week, uh, our good friend Tom was going in saying that he has seen the cover for Ronin and says it's maybe the most unique cover in the history of Star Wars publishing. And uh, if the cover is that good, I, I this novel is going to blow us away as well. So, very excited. So glad we got those looks. And of course, if you want to pick up Ronin or if you want to pick up the next two High Republic projects, Out of the Shadows, which is coming out on July 27th, and Tempest Runner, the audio drama which is coming out August 31st, head over to utini.com, hit our new releases page. All of the stuff that you want to buy is there. Um, everything you want to buy. What do you want to buy? It's not a book or a comic. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Sorry to put that on y'all. All right. Next up, uh, we have our first two book reviews of The Rising Storm. I had to put them in here. We had people that finished them immediately and put their reviews on Utini, so we got to read them out. Uh, Charles, you want to tackle this, this mammoth first one? Holy smokes. Yeah, okay. sorry, buddy. <laughs> yes. Uh, Lando, our good buddy Lando, who's written a lot of reviews for this site, he reviewed The Rising Storm by Kevin Scott and unsurprisingly to me gave it five stars. Says The Rising Storm keeps the bar high. 
He goes on to say, after what I consider to be the best Star Wars entry into canon with Charles Soule's The Light of the Jedi, the High Republic Initiative created a tough standard to surpass, let alone maintain. With Kevin Scott helming the second adult novel, anticipa anticipation was at such a high level that only the most momentous book releases have had. Does The Rising Storm live up to the standard that Light of the Jedi set? Well, kind of. Ooh. The best part I can compare, uh, the best way I can compare these books is by explaining the difference in structure. Where Light of the Jedi was split into parts, The Rising Storm is not. Because of this, Light of the Jedi was able to have one third of its length dedicated to maybe the most intense and unput downable sections of a book I've ever read in its first third. After that, however, the books never recapture that level of engagement that had me absolutely devouring the first chunk. The Rising Storm, on the other hand, is a bit more of a slow burn with very short chapters allowing us to jump between the main characters in short bursts, slowly understanding each storyline over time until the big moment about halfway through that, though not quite as grabbing or urgent as the great disaster in Light of the Jedi, is still very engaging and carries weight for the future of the High Republic storyline. In the simplest terms, Light of the Jedi has a higher high than The Rising Storm, but The Rising Storm is more consistent, at least in my own reading experience. Another big difference from Light of the Jedi, and I feel bad constantly comparing these two, but it is kind of inevitable, is who we get the point of view of. In Light of the Jedi, we get a lot of Avar and Elzar, Loden and Bell, and a few others, but primarily them. In The Rising Storm, Stellan kind of replaces Avar while Elzar is still present. Bell and his new master and Dira have quite a bit of story, and newcomer Ty York gets a bit of time as well. The villains get seemingly much more time than they did in Light of the Jedi, which was a welcome surprise, especially considering the direction the Nile leadership seems to be taking, with some of Rose's subordinates not feeling like remaining subordinates for much longer. I really enjoyed this novel as much as I enjoyed Light of the Jedi, albeit for different reasons. Kevin has proven himself yet again, this time in the novel world, having already proven himself in both comics and the audio drama realms. Speaking of which, Tempest Runner, Kevin's upcoming audio drama centered on Lorna D, has only risen in anticipation after seeing how Kevin wrote Lorna and will hopefully explore more of her place within the Nile. Likewise, Kevin's upcoming graphic novel, The Monster of Temple Peak, starring newcomer Ty York, will also be a much anticipated release in the near future. I continue to be extremely excited by The High Republic, and if Light of the Jedi was Avar's book and The Rising Storm was Stellan's book, I certainly hope the next adult novel is Elzar's book, because the stuff they've done with his smaller roles in both of the previous books have set him up to feel like a key player with some big potential for the future. Whew, I'm going to well take well a done. <laughs> Well I'm done. Take a sip of my drink, and I am <laughs> going to let uh, Wesley tackle JG Cars's review. Yes, well done, Lando. Um, let's see here. All right, JG Cars has has reviewed *The Rising Storm* by Kevin Scott and gave it none other five stars. A thrilling, emotional page turner. So, *The Rising Storm* follows *Light of the Jedi* as being one of the most cinematic Star Wars books to date. The Rising Storm is relentless and full of emotion, forcing you to turn every page until there is none left. The bar was very high, but Kevin Scott surpassed it, and then some. I teared up at parts and audibly gasped at others. Every character and moment felt like it mattered, and that it would pay off in the book or in the future stories to come. The High Republic is shaping up to be one of the best additions to canon, and one of, if not, my favorite era. The Rising Storm solidifies that leading me wanting more. Oh, I can't wait to finish the damn book now. I mean, <laughs> from both of these reviews, especially uh, this one here. I mean, they gave they Kevin Scott surpassed. I mean, that's that's yeah. amazing. That's kind of it's very hard to do. <laughs> Charles, we're well, doing a show. Put the book down. Sorry, sorry. You start your second read. But I think that that is and honestly one of the one of the things I love about doing these reviews on the show and seeing all of your your reviews in the audience uh, on the site. Is it is that moment of like we can we can sit up here and we'll talk about the 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 stuff in the format we have our outlines, but having the audience just be like, hey, I love this thing, and someone else being like, yo, I also love this thing. Like, mm -hmm. it's just so fun, and it is that community that I know I wish I would have had like in high school, and that I wish I would have known growing up. And it's so fun to read all y'all's reviews, and we have a bunch more that have been coming in this week. Keep them coming. We're gonna keep putting more on the show. And if you don't know what we're talking about, head over to utini.com. Find your book in the complete book profile. You can search it in the search bar, find it on the timeline, however you want. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you can leave your star rating and a written review. We will read it on the show and get other people just as hype about stuff that you love. 
All right. Speaking of stuff that we love, we're going to take a really quick break here. Again, just ogle at Jose's mind mel- mind blowing, mind melting, mind altering work, and then we're going to talk about. I mean, the higher public, baby. It's what we're doing. So we'll see you back here in just a second. All right, welcome back, everybody. So tonight, as we've done in the first half, we're going to keep geeking out about the higher public because, honestly, it's still weird that we're getting this. It is weird that as a book-centered community, the biggest thing arguably happening in Star Wars right now is books. So to start us off tonight, boys, I want to ask you all kind of what we said at the start. How does the first week of release of Wave 2 of the higher public compare to the release of Wave 1? Because back then we were starting a whole brand new thing. We had no idea what was going to happen. And as Lando said in their review, like, we're, we had a lot of hype going into this one. Yeah, it's it, it gets to stand on the shoulders of Wave 1, right? That's kind of what we were saying earlier. Um, whereas Wave 1 started and there was the anticipation of, I don't know what this thing is going to be. Mm-hmm. Now it, it was the anticipation of I know what this thing is and it's freaking amazing and I need more <laughs> yeah. of it and um and I think we've seen a lot of that kind of fervor like a lot of people have really flown through this book um mm-hmm. myself being one of them because it's hard to put down so totally and it- wave one wave one I think had a had a pretty had a pretty crazy release party I guess just because it's something that we've never seen before. It's a bunch of new characters, a new era. Mm-hmm. And then on top of what we've already learned through the first uh, couple of books and the comics, we get The Rising Storm, which has had great rave reviews. And so, I mean, I, I don't know if I can compare Wave 2 to Wave 1 just because Wave 1 was so groundbreaking as to Star Wars literature and Star Wars publishing, but mm-hmm. I think it's pretty close. It's pretty close. Yeah, for me, this this felt, for multiple reasons, I think this felt like the ending of The Force Awakens. You know, you've got Rey holding out that oh, lightsaber, waiting yeah. on Luke to take it. And you're just like, why, what is what is happening? I need, I need to see this moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what Kevin does with it is just phenomenal. But yeah, it, I think that's what it felt like to me. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with everything you guys are saying. And I think that it felt like the community as a whole, the Star Wars literature community, if we're going to call ourselves that, was a little more prepared to be hyped and be excited because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I've never seen this level of, like, I guess, online discourse about a new release. I I don't know when the last time it was, honestly. Light of the Jedi was huge. That first week was incredible. Mm -hmm. It felt like a movie release. We all talked about it. And I think this one at least met that, if not surpassed it. And I think part of it is because, I mean, Kevin Scott was our social butterfly for the Utinis for last year, not by mistake. He's been incredible at online engagement, so people feel very connected to him as an author. So that's been great. And DJO, Daniel Jose Older, who wrote Crash Point, also similarly very engaged. And it's felt like there's been a lot more people talking freely about it, uh, a lot more tweets, a lot more Discord activity. Um, and it's been really cool to see that because I think we were all a little more braced for it. And I also wonder if things like the out-of-print version and the uh, the Target exclusive cover, like eventizing the merchandise of it mm-hmm. you know because it's a, it's a business at the end of the day right i mean they're, they're sure. making money for sure but did the fact that there were more covers and more like uh, the shirts and stuff dropped like did that add to your guys's personal enjoyment at all i think it did because i mean it's we're not getting movies until 2022 is that when the 
it 2023? 20, uh, 20, yeah, I think it might be 23. Okay. I think it might be 23. Yes. So we're not getting movies for a while. And yeah. these are our movies, right? These are our in-depth stories mm -hmm. that aren't 30-minute animation or it's not mm. um, like a, a special on Disney+. Plus. These are our, yeah, that take a while to read and mm -hmm. give a, get us talking. Get us talking in Discord. Get us talking on Twitter. So yeah, yeah th this is basically our type of of movie release and i love it i think it's great because finally more people are getting into the books like you want to know what's going on in star wars you have to pick up a book now but you're gonna yeah love <laughs> you gotta pick up a book now i love that yeah and it and it seems like i mean these poor authors the i mean we are part of the problem because the amount of press interviews i saw about rising storm and crash point like I feel like they upped that even more so from the first wave. I mean, they were everywhere. There's Barnes and Noble events. There was other general events. There were trailers. There was a, a trailer on the Star Wars YouTube channel for a book wave. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah talk how about is it, it possible? feeling like a movie, right? If yeah, you actually put trailers out for these waves. It's incredible, and we are like, we're in a little bit of a bubble as the Star Wars literature community, and sure. A bubble within a bubble when you look at, at the Utini community in particular, mm -hmm. but it really does like think back to uh, the last Star Wars movie you saw. You went to a midnight premiere or whatever, or opening week, whenever it was you made it, and like that buzz beforehand when you're sitting in the theater, like just waiting, waiting mm -hmm. for the movie to start. Like it felt like that within our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and from everything I've seen online from people that aren't necessarily Utini they were kind of expressing the same thing. And so if you find yourself craving that, and I think probably most Star Wars fans do, and you're sitting here waiting around for a movie, you don't have to, just like Wes said, just pick up a book now, as he said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can experience that. Well, and it shows, I think all the work that they're doing on this front end, it shows how much they believe in it. I mean, they're willing right. to, to put their time and their dollars towards promoting it. Um, and that's something that we don't see except for with movies typically, um, you know, or major television series, like they're willing to fork marketing dollars at, at a book. Um, and it just, it shows that level of belief. I think that we haven't seen in a while. Yeah. And, and as being nasty says in the chat right now, we, they really put their money where their mouth was when it comes to things like shop. Disney had star Wars book t-shirts on it. Mm -hmm. Like there were things that came out where they that can that costs money that that is, is merchandising dollars on the main disney site it's not just the star wars branch this is full-on disney and i want to give a quick shout out personally to Alyssa hervitz who is the who does a lot of the pr over at disney for disney books she's the reason that we we get our review copies that we get our interviews all set she's been kind of heading the higher public like initiative and tweeting out where to find the shirts and all that stuff but it's been this wave of excitement that she's been riding and that we've all been kind of riding. And I think another thing that really helped as I look at the, the books next to me here is it seemed like, you know, again, no spoilers here, but Rising Storm and Race to Crash Point Tower really work together very well. And I think that because, uh, Tim, I know you had you read those like you finished Rising Storm one day, you read <laughs> Crash Point Tower immediately back to back. How did you feel about their integration versus the integration of uh, Wave One, where they seemed maybe a little more, a little more disparate? Yeah. So I, Wave One, I think you obviously had to. It was a lot of setup, right? You're building up to this giant event series, right? Um, and I think it's really cool with what they've done in Wave Two. Um, these stories, I mean, you can perfectly read them on their own. Um, you know, if you yep. only read middle grades books, you can read all the middle grades books and be just fine. Um, but this one is more like. The Rising Storm is kind of the main story. And then Race Crash Point Tower just fills in the details. Um, and it's yeah. just, it's beautiful the way that it kind of sets and gives you a more full picture. Um, and the fact that it also ties in so well with the other media, the comics, um, with the Marvel's The High Republic and IDW's The High Republic Adventures, um, the crossover, you know, they, they're sharing characters um, and authors are writing their own in new forms and they're, you know, writing things that some of their friends have created. Like, it's just, it's, it fits. It just fits so well. Um, and it's much more natural and very smooth. Yeah. And that was something we talked to Daniel Jose Older about, like interview dropping tomorrow on the YouTube channel. Uh, about like using his own characters from higher public adventures in crash point and then it's no mistake that kevin was writing the main comic and then red rising storm so the two books that launched wave two were written by people who were already writing these characters for like 
six months of published content. I mean, yeah. we we all know they've written way ahead, but they have already had these characters lives in their hands they've already created they've already been seeding things for six months subconsciously for those of us that have been following the comics shout out to our cosmic force friends who talk about those and now they got to just basically explode it on a larger scale and caroline and chirps in the chat do not toy with me pun intended on how much we need <laughs> funkos and legos <laughs> in wave three and that is i guess my other question to you all it seems like wave one we had the we had the books it's great we had the, the Goldsboro edition and the out of print version of Light of the Jedi. But now I think I'm going to own four copies of Rising Storm, three copies of Out of the Shadows and uh, 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 there's T-shirts going up. I, I have a High Republic Fair shirt coming like it's a bit more on the show. Let's predict wave three and or phase one or phase two wave one, whatever's next. Do we get toys? Do you think it's gonna happen? Oh. So the toys That's... if toys would be on the success of wave one and two, right? And so yeah. wave one and two were a tremendous success from I mean, from our point of view, right? So because yeah. we've we've seen people, our community included, buy multiple copies of the books, including mm -hmm. like the merchandise. So they're seeing that this is this is a money grab. They're 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 getting the they're getting the payback for them putting out what they're doing for right. a literary project, which is crazy. So yeah. I think I think we might. Oh man, I don't know. Lego might be might be like the, the oh. upper tier. Yeah. Well, but, no, but then you're Funko, gonna hurt my wallet Funko, prematurely. Please. I think Funko. there's there's a hunger for merchandise though, is mm -hmm. what we're seeing because I mean like. Yeah. Yes, we're all like in the deep end when it comes to this stuff, but like <laughs> we're all excited and we're all buying it and, and we all want more. Um, yeah. I think they're going to keep stepping it up because I mean, I really don't see this era or this overall story of the High Republic crashing down. Like, there's not going to be a great disaster, I don't predict, <laughs> of the High Republic in real right. life. So I think we're going to get there. You know what I would love even more than? toys uh yeah how about a video game man let me see that high republic video game <sighs> i will lose it yeah it, uh, there, there's just so many infinite possibilities for them to explore and i think now that they know wave one and wave two were successful and again we we don't have the the new york times stats yet of of what it was like cause we know light of the jedi premiered at number one on the new york times who's to say if rising storm makes the list as well fingers crossed um, we certainly tried to help with how many copies we bought. My God, but <laughs> <laughs> like, I you know a lot of these companies that aren't in the literature world, like you're saying West Lego and like you're saying Charles with video games, they need to see the bottom line first. And I think that the Star Wars community, for the most part, we have put our wallets where our mouths are. Like we have said, hey, we love this thing. The quality's been great. The attitude's been awesome. So I definitely think it's possible. I do think the biggest tease so far has been that variant cover that came out last week of a future High Republic issue where it's the Keeve Trennis uh, three and three quarter inch Absolutely. drawing. And I'm like, you bastards, <laughs> you knew what you were doing. <laughs> like, Absolutely. And it's like, here's what the toy would be. It doesn't exist yet, but wouldn't that be cool? And you're like, yeah, man, it we would be. Going for. Yeah, I want to see the sales on that issue alone. And yeah. be like, look, see, here it is. Like, this yeah. is it. Here's Give me proof. Uh, so, so merchandise, awesome. We want it content. Great. We love it. Uh, let's talk spoilers, not spoiling anything real quick. Don't pause. Don't leave. Um, the idea of spoiler culture is, is always been huge in star Wars, especially with the movies. I mean, let's be real. Part of the reason you see it at midnight is panic. And part of the reason that we get up before work on a Friday morning when bad batch comes out or Mandalorian is because I gotta watch it before I see a spoiler which sucks. I mean, <laughs> it's great to watch it, but it's not fun. Yeah. But books are weird because Wes, as you said, this is, these take longer. These take a long time to read, but you don't want to silence yourself from discourse for that long. So I wanted to chat a little bit with you guys about how to avoid spoilers for our audience and in our community around book releases, because it's, it's something that we've kind of Im implemented, but we've never really talked about. So on our discord channel, for all of y'all that don't know, we have a certain channel for every new book release and we have a, a rule. 
one month after book release, we talk about it out here on the show. Living Force Roundtable, one month. That's when we go into spoilers. On Discord, though, you get three months after a book release, you got to use spoiler tags. So I want to ask you guys, for now that we've been using spoiler tags for a while, it's a weird new thing, has that affected your enjoyment of reading at all? Or what, what have you seen the implementation of physical spoiler tags that block out text? What effect has that had on the community's ability to enjoy a book at a different pace? I think it's incredibly effective because if I go in, if I've read say 20 pages of, let's just say a rising storm, for example, um, and I want to go and talk about this. Great example. Great random book to choose. <laughs> I like it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Was, was, West, was, what page what are I, you actually on of the rising storm? Probably 20. 20? I probably wasn't lying at all. <laughs> so you're on chapter 17. <laughs> now I'm a quarter of the way yeah. through. So it's what a hundred. Um, yeah. But if I see, if I start seeing these blocked out text, it's just black over. It's like, hey, what did y'all think about just black text? It's like a black box over nothing. Um, then I don't, then I don't go to it. Like, I, if I click on it, then I have the, I'm doing the disservice to myself. I'm doing, yeah. the, I am doing the, the thing that spoils it for me. So if I see these black text marks, then it shows, oh, that's a spoiler. I'm not going to look at it. I'll just move on to something else, but I'd like to, I mean, you can bring up in your, in another, uh, in another thread or in the same channel, just, Hey, does anybody read? And then I don't know, it's up to page to a page. That would be probably better mm -hmm. to, to make yeah. everybody aware of what you're, what you've read and what you haven't. Yeah. Yeah. But it's been really cool to see the way that they've been utilized in our discord. Right. And I think this book more than any other, they've been really good about going chapter 38 hyphen black text. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. And, Cause the chapter so is so short that you're like, Oh, you're within five or six pages. Right. So there's a, a motivating factor as well of like, Oh, I need to find some time to get on this and read because I want to click that dang button so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I never yeah. thought about it as a reward system because it is. It's like, yeah. we're here, the comments are here, and when you get there, your reward is getting there. Um, ooh, Corey, you in the chat makes a great point. Can we clarify what we're talking about here? So what we're talking about specifically, if you're not in our Discord community, Discord as a whole is just a giant chat community, right? If you join our Discord, you get a username, and then you get to see a bunch of different channels that you can click on, and there's discussions going on, like old-style message boards back in the day. In Discord, there's an ability where you can put little like uh, like URL codes, but it's just two lines on the front and the back of your text that you write. And if you put the code in that the, that the app explains, you can write whatever you want. And then when you enter that into the channel, it blacks out all that text. So anyone reading can click on that block and they can read it as they want. But what our community has been doing beautifully is been signifying, as, uh, as Wes and Timothy just said, you were saying chapter... 18 and then a black text box so if you've read through chapter 18 you can click on that and join in that conversation and reply to that person and if you haven't no harm no foul you can go in that channel and you're not going to get anything spoiled for you but maybe you have chapter 7 or maybe you have chapter 11 or so and so and it's a really just a neat way to kind of evolve as online discourse evolves because a lot of us have had to you know stop ourselves from spoiling things of you know you want to discuss it you want to discuss it, especially this book what happens and this has been a great tool that we've been able to use to do that i know people on twitter have been like hashtagging rising storm spoilers or hashtag spoilers whatever it may be uh but it's been just been really cool to see that and i guess what i'm saying is overall if you're listening to this and you haven't joined our discord or you're looking for a place to talk about books without spoiling things for yourself or other people this is a cool new tool that is net i will say has never been utilized this much as rising storm it's astonishing yeah all right now now here's here's where the fun begins as our very own adam dyson's favorite character would say uh let's geek out for a bit here at the end of the show uh about our favorite high republic designs because we talked to daniel jose older about why the high republic is so important as a visual era We've gotten concept art, we've gotten comics, we've gotten motion videos, all these things. And that has led to some freaking incredible design work. Uh, so before we go into specifics, guys, let's go around the horn. Charles, I'll start with you. What's been one of your favorite, just overall visual things the High Republic has done that has really like grasped you personally? 
Yeah. So I have to say starlight beacon, like just the idea oh, yeah. of starlight beacon. Right? Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, not, not just the fact that it's like this cool space station that's out in the wild west of space, but like also what it represents, um, all of the imagery, I, I think the background on my iPad that I used to read some of these books and comics has been Starlight Beacon like since the first images were released. I Dang. mean, it's just this, yeah, it's, it's so symbolic and it just feels so epic. Um, I absolutely love the idea of it. Awesome. Tim, how about you, man? I have really enjoyed um the design of the outfits i mean like Buryaga agaberry is my favorite in the world right <laughs> and his yes. his concept art like he looks regal he looks huggable um and you know <laughs> that he's not going to intentionally try to rip your arm off um, that's true accidents just, happen yes accidents do happen but not with him <laughs> Um, and I just, I, I love the aesthetic that they're going for, um, that this really is one of the best times in the galaxy. This is, mm-hmm. things are supposed to be good. Um, and the Jedi are, are here for light and life. And, um, I, I think mm-hmm. that's communicated really well in, in the design choices for their, their outfits, the gold embroidery, the, everything just looks, it's just mm, so clean. Absolutely. We'll get a lot of those specifics here in a sec. Uh, Wes, how about you, man? What's your, what's your overall favorite visual thing? Uh, I want to say the new lightsabers. So, oh they, yeah, they are mm. above and beyond something. They're very different than what we're used to, right? So, like the right. the lightsabers we're used to are made looks like one a cylindrical piece is kind of the basis, yeah. right? So, mm-hmm. but these new uh, lightsabers they ha- they look like uh, like say a sword from uh, the Knights of the Round Table where it has those. Um, I don't know what you call them. The things. Queon. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, but they're the Queon are the things <laughs> and the handle. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I love the the design of these new lightsabers. They're great. There's there's something, and they're not just like lightsabers. Not like a sword. There's a like yeah. isn't there like a battle axe that Lorna D has or something that I, that's oh on yeah. The, uh, it's on so the sick. Rising Storm out of print cover, and then oh it's um, coming from. Uh, Oh man, the the lightning the late the lightsaber whip that we saw. Yep. And yes. uh, so, I mean, I love the part of the of the lightsaber. It's great. Something new that we finally get to see. Yeah. No, I've I've been absolutely adoring those, and and I think I'm I'm gonna take something that B Nasty just said in the chat here. I've been loving specifically the variant covers of the comics because I feel like that has been. Uh, a way for a lot of artists to kind of expand the visual vocabulary of the era without necessarily worrying about being super truthful to the specific narrative or to the characters, or whatever. Because for those of you that may not be comics collectors or readers, a lot of times when a comic book comes out, you'll get the main cover that kind of hints toward the story, what's going on. And then there's a variant where another artist gets a crack at it and they can interpret it in a different way. And a lot of the High Republic variant covers have just been these amazing character pieces that have just kind of shown how awesome these characters look and how cool they are and how flowing, like Tim, you said, the the clothing is and how how regal and heroic it is. And I've really been liking that. And uh, and now what, what I want to do, we, we all sent, I believe earlier today, we sent Wes some pictures and what I would like to do now is just kind of go through some of our greatest hits of things we love about the High Republic. So, all right. Oh, my gosh. Look at this glorious slideshow of images. That so for our audio, is so cool. Yeah. For our audio listeners, we're going to go bit by bit. We'll try to describe them as specifically as possible. Uh, but if you want to see the full, uh, the full, I guess, experience of this show, go ahead and check out the video element. But uh, the first two are mine, and then I'll, I'll throw it off to, I believe... I'm not going to guess who the next one is, but the first one is the guy on my shirt tonight. When I saw the first concept art image of Markeon Rowe, or Marcian Rowe, if you're an audiobook listener. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mark, we love you, buddy. Uh, I was... This this established what the higher public was going to be to me. This is not a prequel, original, or sequel trilogy era villain. This is brand new the eye in the center of the helmet is so distinct the cape is weathered the stance is powerful and this this look just really took me back when i first saw it and in the six months since that first entry it's still maybe my favorite image of the whole era yeah it's got very like dark legends vibes 
or <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> that would, sure that they that the illustrator had put in that book so like yeah Grant Fables Griffin kind of stuff yeah it's great that same artist so yeah yeah I love Mark Young that's kind of the precedent for all of the Nile too right with the gas mm-hmm. mask aesthetic and you know just the grungy kind of gritty whole visual aspect for all of them it's incredible uh yeah. B nasty says I, I he really hopes that we get an art book of this era oh, and oh, I, yeah. I would love <laughs> to see that yeah and, and and like we said a shout out to grant griffin who did that concept art and has been doing a lot of the concept art he is in fact the artist for missing fables the george mann series there and for the upcoming life day treasury so if you need more of that get his stuff uh, the second image we have here is another one that I submitted, which is just the design of the vectors, man. The mosquitoes of the Jedi Order. These things, <laughs> like, they, so true. They, yeah, right? not wrong. <laughs> They're like the description of them in light of the Jedi is still one of my favorite descriptors of a ship. The fact that you you basically pilot it with the Force, and the Jedi together are called the Drift, and they use their lightsabers to power the weapons. Like it's conceptually so cool. And if you look at this picture of the of the ship, it is speed. This thing is fast, and you can tell even in a two dimensional still. And I, this is this is the Lego we need, as we talked about earlier here in the oh, show. Wow. It's just, it's gorgeous, and it, and it, it's, and it, so, it's so minimalist that it'd probably be like seventeen mm-hmm. pieces, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and three hundred dollars. Yeah, I was just saying, forty nine ninety nine. Yeah. So, Mark, you end of the vector remind you. Uh, What's our next one? Who had our next picture? Okay, these next few are mine. Um, this first one is uh, an actual scene from the comics, but it is from the dedication of Starlight Beacon. So I already brought up how much I love the space station in and of itself. But this image, I feel like, speaks specifically so much to what this era is. And it, it does that by showing a lot of Jedi all together. Um, in like tim was saying earlier this very regal dress right so they they have all of their white robes on because we learned that they're like you know ceremonial robes versus everyday robes these are the more ceremonial ones and just all the lightsabers raised in the air like just everything about this is so inspiring i just love this image yeah there's a yeah a whole nother or two sets of jedi up on the left and the right I didn't yeah, even realize that, when that. I first saw that. <laughs> yeah. And and after us seeing the Jedi at their power up until this point visually has really been like the prequel era where they're pretty divided and there's not a ton to see this union, you know, they're, they're really good at catchphrases, right? For light and life. We are all the Republic, but they're all based on unity. And I love that you picked this image, Charles, because it shows characters from light of the Jedi and the higher Republic comic and Republic adventures. And like, all yeah. of the different books and mediums are united for light and life in this one image. And I think that really just kind of explains what the higher public is. Absolutely. I love that one. Great choice. Now, this next one uh, of mine was also brought up earlier. It is Vernestra Rowe and her light whip. Um, <laughs> say say light, light, say light, whip. whip. Light. Now say light whip, whip. light whip. Light whip. Light whip. Um, <laughs> I just God. I really like this style actually like it's more uh it's more cartoon less realistic like this feels like something that I could have watched as a kid like on Saturday or Sunday morning um but also just it shows I think how I, I don't how willing they are in this era I think to just play around and, and try yeah, things mm-hmm. I mean Emery over here who's the blonde Jedi on the left is rocking this gold cape I mean he actually looks like a superhero Vernestra Rowe <laughs> has her light whip going crazy and it's just not something that I expected to see but you see it and it just feels Star Wars it feels so so genuine to what Star Wars is yeah, and shout out to uh, Peter Antonson is the artist of this. He did the art for both uh, Race to Crash Point Tower and A Test of Courage. And if you haven't picked those up, this is one of the images inside the book. There's like little uh, right. paintings essentially that that appear sporadically through and that continued with Crash Point Tower as well. Which 
that's a good point to bring up too. It's nice that they're using the same art styles and even the same artists between some of these books, because if yeah. you are just reading the middle grades, like there's consistency there. If you look at the, you know, light of the Jedi out of print, uh, version versus even the, the target exclusive. I don't know if those are the same artists. I think that um, I, th- yeah, it's similar. You know what? I, though, I was the, so the confident. Style. I think so. Yeah, regardless yeah. if it is or not, the style is very similar. So if you're just looking through those images, like there's a lot of connection there. Absolutely. Great pick. Love Vern. Uh, another plug for Out of the Shadows coming up at the end of this month. Uh, she's on the cover and it, uh, yep, no spoilers here, but she does a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. And then this last one, I think I've already said my piece on Starlight Beacon, <laughs> but I mean, just, just look at this. If you are, li- if this is an audio, experience for you right now like go over to youtube and and pull this video up because you got to see this image of starlight beacon it's from the outside uh it just looks it it's a castle in space it's so majestic and i what I a descriptor i love yeah. that it, it is it is a castle in space and let's be honest this is the lego set we need this is yes. the one get, this would be three thousand dollars Get this to Kevin Scott's porch right now so he can begin building it. You this, monsters. This picture reminds me of the ivory tower from the never ending story. Have y'all seen that? Yeah. Well, yeah. Not since I was a wee dad. <laughs> just that the top, that there the very top kind of looks the same as the ivory Falcor! tower. <laughs> it it gives me a Justice League watchtower vibes. There you go. Also super solid. Yeah, and I'm gonna and throw I, this out there. Cinderella's castle. <laughs> Boom. Oh I yeah, said it. the white Cinderella's spires. Cinderella's Justice League castle in space during the never-ending story. Perfect. That's Starlight. That's Beacon. the movie we need. Yes. <laughs> hey man, Disney's gonna keep buying stuff. I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, this is your MVP right here, Tim. Right? Yeah, it is. Yes, this is very Aga Aga Berry. I mean, just look at him. Don't you want to give him a hug? <laughs> so um, bad. <laughs> But yeah, I love the I love the gold. I love the the High Republic logo in the middle. Like everything about this just screams non-threatening. Um, mm-hmm. Even the even down to the braided beard, right? That he's got yeah. underneath him. Um, yeah. I just I, I love it. And I don't, there's not enough that can be said about how great Barriaga is. Um, yeah. His lightsaber is sick. Yeah, so yeah, it's sick. huge. Yeah. If if that ever appears at um, Galaxy's Edge, that will be my first lightsaber purchase. I promise. <laughs> I love that, and and I Make also that love guy his... a translator, please. <laughs> yes. No, but I mean honestly, and I'm going to go on a tangent, but that's Do one it. of the best things about him. I think is and kind of indicative of the High Republic at large um is that you you don't have to understand him like you don't have to understand the words that he's saying to to know what it is that he's feeling or for him to understand what everyone else is feeling he has some incredible moments in light of the jedi right where he's like i know that this kid is struggling and i just need to be there um and that whole kind of message around communication i think is so important i mean especially for today like we live in really weird times really difficult times we're communicating in very different ways that we've never done before. And I love that Berriaga represents kind of that to me of you can just be there. And sometimes that's enough. So. Dang. I love him. I love that. That's perfect, man. Oh, so, oh my gosh. Speaking of someone who is always there for us. What a good dog. What's this next one? <laughs> Charles, you put this one up at okay. the last minute. Yes, I did. So sorry. I'm. I'm jumping back into the lineup here. Hold but on, this did is you a... see what I had, what I had named it? Can you see? What'd you I, name it? Just it just says it say? Devil Dog on there. Devil, devil dog. dog. Pretty much. Pretty She's much. She's the so best Devil picture. Dog. <laughs> Ember the Charhound, and I think on our last episode of the Living Force, I made my feelings for this Devil Dog, as Wes calls it, very clear. I love Ember. Ember. I would die for Ember. Um, and this was one of the first uh, images that we got. You know, we got the concept art with Bell Zetafar's concept art. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we got this, and then she is also on the cover, at least the Target uh, exclusive cover of the Rising Storm. So Ember is fantastic. Fire breathing man's best friend. What more could you want? Yeah, and I, and I love the, the 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 dedication to creatures in the High Republic has been so intense. And from all the authors, they've been very clear about how much they love things like Jabba's palace and things when they were kids and now it's like really showing in their work like putting a dog but not just a dog right a dog that has these crazy teeth and all this fire 
as a central part of the crew is is kind of a big swing for Star Wars. Like we don't really have a lot of animal companions, but there's been a lot of creature development in the higher Republic outside of even just the villains. Like there's been so many interesting new creatures. And uh, again, without spoilers, the rising storm brings in a lot of new creatures to the Star Wars mythos. Like I, I always like to Google Wikipedia stuff as I'm reading for reviews to make sure I know what I'm getting at. And a lot yeah. of them didn't have entries yet. And uh, there are, Let's see, what are they called? The sand vols are something that people read in Rising Storm. I won't tell you yes. what they are. They are my new favorite animal in the history of Star Wars. So Absolutely. shout out to all the animals in the High Republic. Yeah, so my next two are um, comics uh, pages. And mostly it's just, I mean, in, in, in spite of them just being absolutely incredible to look at, um, I love that this initiative is has a comic component to it because we can mm. see more of the story. Um, like you can think like the great disaster is it, it's what it sounds like a great disaster, but then to see that in Star Wars Adventures or the High Republic Adventures and to be like, oh, this is like galactically awful, apocalyptic. Um, just to get that vision of it, um, get get the eyeballs on it is so cool and so powerful. And I love the work um, that Daniel Jose Older um, and Harvey Talibo, like it's just, it's beautiful. And new creatures, old creatures, um, but just looking at giant space debris coming out of what looks like this awful black hole-esque thing yeah. is just horrifying um and it really kind of helps to set in just how massive this event was yeah uh, got a pompeii vibe Oof. yeah, yeah very, much so, very much so very much so and it makes me care about a doug which i think is like super heroic <laughs> uh you're like trying to say you don't care about sebulba not even a little bit bro uh, <laughs> but, but i will also say i think we've said on a bunch of different shows and we will keep plugging away at this if you're not reading the high republic adventures you're gonna get you i mean you can get the main story like we said you can read whatever you want and still get good stories but you are missing out on some of the best characters and best visuals in the high republic because mm -hmm. it's not it's not like the star wars adventures comic where it's just a bunch of non-connected kind of segue stories which are great and fun in their own right this is a continuous story with a bunch of great new characters in the high republic era with some of the best art uh that we've seen in the entire initiative so just plugging away again that you gotta be reading the high republic adventures yeah and then this next one um I, you know, it's it's an ish, it's a page from Star Wars: The High Republic. I think it's number four. Um, I love that we got concept art for the Dringer, um, but to see them once again in a comic, um, they are horrifying. I was talking yeah. to some friends <laughs> recently, and they were like, "I mean, they just they sound like shrubs, right?" And I'm like, "No, no, 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 <laughs> no. You 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 need to look at some of this concept art. Look at what is happening in the comics." And they're like, "Oh, these guys are actually horrifying." Um, and so, yeah, I, I love the designs, um, of these beasts. They have these beaks and horns, but they're trees and viney and the things that, um, Ario and Adido is able to do with, uh, Kevin Scott's work is just on another level. Um, and to see like Skier, right. And I, I'm losing Skier. his, um, what is what is Trandoshan? Is that right? Yeah, um, Trandoshan. Yeah. To, yeah, to see what they've been able to do, like with his ability to to regrow limbs and to this weird thing, like it's so cool and Star Wars, and I love it. Is that is yeah. that his arm, like as as being regrown but not fully regrown yet? There's a there's a twist in there. Oh, yeah. Right, I'll, I'll yeah. Hold off. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but but I will say one of the things I love about this frame that you chose specifically is is that it really makes the Dren gear an intense yeah. villain. Because I'll I'll be honest, I did not love the Dren gear in Into the Dark when we met them. I thought in pros they didn't quite work as well for me as I as I wanted them to. And I talked about that a bit in our roundtable episode about it. But in the comics, they have totally switched for me, and I really mm -hmm. enjoy them in there. Um, and they come out a little bit more in wave two in other media. And I think that I, I, now I'm starting to get it now. I, now I understand what's going on with them. So just goes to show you that sometimes if you're not getting characters, maybe there's not their medium for you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. All right. What do we got next? Wes? Oh, okay. Yeah. This is my favorite too. Yeah. Wes, take it away, man. I put it in here, but so go pretty. for it. <laughs> this is the, this is the, another, uh, cover it's the out of print cover correct 
So uh, yep. this is when you yep. open the book, um, open the cover front and back and turn it over. This is oh. the front and back together. So from what I can tell, that's Lorna D with her, with her uh, Vibra axe that I got corrected on. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, her giant laser battle axe. It looks like Elzar Man there with doing a... Uh, but it's Stellan, baby. It's Stellan. I'm sorry. Stellan is doing a... Um, oh, good. He's spinning his lightsaber as a sort of shield from what mm -hmm. it looks like. Um, and then we have our four-eyed lions that are fighting back against the uh, against Matari the Nile. and Voru. <laughs> Matari and Voru, who, by the way, four-eyed, awesome, badass lions. Like, great job, Star Wars creators. Yeah. Named Incredible. after Named after the old Coruscant gods. Like, what? Oh, oh yeah. Well, because then you got <laughs> Lena So, their master, up on a platform above them as as there's the, this giant firefight. And then in the background, you get the, the, the planet... Um, what are they called? The not the stages, like the, the, the floating uh, islands, the islands, yeah. the platforms, yeah. Which if you've read the Rising Storm again, you see more of. Ah, this is my this is my this is my desktop wallpaper, man. Like yeah. this is the most gorgeous thing, and mine still hasn't shipped. I'm sure it will be out of print. <laughs> I love y'all. Just I I want an email. I just like an email. But I'm sorry, Eric. Did you mention the Jedi riding a dragon? I in the you background? know what. It's maybe the coolest thing that's ever happened <laughs> is that in the top right corner, there is a Jedi riding a dragon into battle. And isn't that what Star Wars is all about? Absolutely. <laughs> it's just oh. been, been reality even more than it already had. I mean, it's broken and thrown in the garbage already. Yeah. But yeah. But and it's just and it's the colors in here. I mean, it, this is such a colorful piece. And I think that. A lot of times we, we sometimes get bogged down in the, the drabness of Star Wars, which is great. The drab aesthetic is awesome. Like your Rogue One aesthetic with your grays and your browns and your dirtiness. I love that. That is very Star Wars. But like to have a cover that has so many brilliant blues and purples and, and the fire is even getting orange glow onto Matari's face in the bottom right. Like just the amount of vibrance that they're putting into this initiative which is all literary is is still just blowing me away every single day which is why i think i do think this is the best piece of art we've gotten thus far and it also happens to be the most recent which is pretty awesome Absolutely. like how freaking cool ah <laughs> uh, so so there we have it folks this is those were some of our our favorite pieces of design uh be nasty i gotta say in the chat uh, he said for me, the Drangir or Reapers from Mass Effect. I could see it. Uh, definitely working those psychological mind games. And any, anytime I get Mass Effect into Star Wars, man, I love it. But uh, as we as we round out this celebration show, which is really what it is, let's go around one more time, guys, and just say one final thing about the High Republic Wave 2, whether it be the design of it, whether it be something that you didn't know in the first wave that is already propelling us towards the next one like what is what is now in your heart about the higher public that is making you want the next piece of content even more uh wes let's start with you um i'm gonna reiterate what i had said on a previous podcast um is what happened to load and great storm <laughs> excellent <laughs> what happened to load and great storm i need to know and that's what i'm most looking forward to to wave two is to figure out what happened to him love that tim how about you buddy um, I, I love how they're humanizing the Jedi. I think, um, for mm -hmm. a lot of people, they've always seemed so, um, OP, so overpowered. And I love that yep. we're getting to see them in some more real human moments, um, and struggles and dealing with loss and grief and making mistakes and how they get past that. And how do you grow? Um, and I just, I, I think this will be one of my favorite things about, this whole initiative is is how things went so great how they were so awesome the jedi were so powerful it's everything we wanted them to be but how yeah. they how they were humbled i guess yeah uh on that note too there's a great there's a great great passage in race to crash point tower where yep. Vernestra and lula Telly sola talk about attachment and it's and i think we talk a lot about attachment in star wars and i think a lot of authors try to tackle it a lot of shows try to tackle it for my money, this middle grade novel, I think, tackles it the best I've seen thus far. Um, so there's another way to talk about how great how great the Jedi are and how honest those conversations are in this initiative. Perfect. Uh, Charles. 
Yeah. So I'm going to keep it kind of in line with the design and aesthetics that I'm really looking forward to is get everything that's going to be surrounding the Republic fair, right? It's a big yeah. plot point that we know is one of the kind of tent poles for wave two. And some of the merchandise that's come out has already shown like some, you know, I don't know, like propaganda posters kind of ads yeah, for the yeah. Republic fair. And I mean, talk about something that I never would have thought I would see in star wars and i will say from what i've read it works so well so yeah. just seeing that whole thing in comics and whatnot i cannot wait yeah uh I, I will say i think i'm gonna go towards the comics themselves i'm excited to see the comics explore more of uh like what the jedi temples are like in the outposts because we hear that there's a lot mm -hmm. of temples and in the you know the prequel we're basically got coruscant and that's kind of what you get. But now there's so many places where the Jedi are. I want to see them. I want to see how they're different. I want to see what the Jedi wear on Elfrona versus what they wear elsewhere on the you know frontier planets. And I'm just really stoked to see how that aesthetic also slowly changes. Because how do we get to brown robed warrior monks from like gold tabard wearing white cape flowing uh, Jedi like we saw in the first image uh, earlier tonight? And... Uh, right. And I think we're going to get it. I mean, we are in this for the long haul, y'all. And I'm, again, thank you to everyone that's been watching and listening and has been in our community talking about this initiative. We're having just as much fun as you are. And we hope that this has been the friend group that you need to geek out about. Um, you know, maybe maybe your siblings or your best friend aren't, aren't going to Target on the day of release to go get a variant cover for a book you already own. But we are. So <laughs> we hope that... Uh, you will stick around to all the Utini High Republic content. We will take a few shows to do a couple other things uh, before our roundtable, which, uh, Charles, you already, you already working on those prompts, man? I'm working on the prompts, and I'll tell you what, some of the Easter eggs are just next level. So there's a ton of new stuff in the High Republic, of course, but like there's some deep cuts, man, so I can't wait to go <laughs> through those. Yeah, uh, without spoilers, maybe uh, maybe listen to Dooku Jedi Lost if it's been a hot minute for y'all, uh, just uh, for fun. Uh, and I do believe our first part of our roundtable for that is going to be on July 26th or August 2nd. We'll have to double check, but we'll keep you all informed, of course, uh, so you'll have plenty of time. But with that being said, that is going to do it for tonight's episode of The Living Force. If you support us on Patreon, we want to say thank you. It is because of you that everything we do here at the show is possible. A special thank you goes out to Cheryl Bell, Patrick Ortiz, and Carl Sander on our Jedi High Council, and Elizabeth Cloutier, Jason Mitchell, Freddie C., and Sally and Chris Eilerson on our Alliance High Command. You can find us all on Twitter. I'm at Eric Eilerson, Charles Zetsy Hankel, Wes is at Boss Wes, Timothy is at T Guthrie. Underscore T Guthrie. Under dang it! Find Tim Close. on Twitter. Uh, and again, Corey is at DocStarWarsMD. A special thank you to Matt Davenport, our amazing editor. Ryan, our graphic designer extraordinaire, who threw in a few new graphics for tonight. And Wes, our producer and community manager. Stay tuned to the site and the channel tomorrow for all your Crash Point Tower needs. A thank you goes out to Charles, Wes, and Tim for podcasting with me tonight. Thanks to all of you in the chat for hanging out. And as always, for light and life!